Welcome to episode 12 of the Camera Shake podcast, the podcast all about photography, videography and anything and everything to do with photo and video. Um, we're back this week uh, with a very special episode because uh, we'll, we are going to meet um, last month's competition winner. So we're going to talk to um, Brian Dukes a little bit later. Uh, but first of all, how was your week? <sighs> Long, <laughs> busy, <laughs> tiring, this is no the, sleep. This is the busiest week since the beginning of lockdown, right? Yes. Oh, without question. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not going to let up for another few days yet no. either. Well, um, it's only, uh, yeah, it's only early on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. yeah, exactly. Well, that's right. So we're recording this on a Monday. Um, and yeah, it's the busiest week I've had since lockdown yeah. already. It's nuts. Yeah, it's mad. It's yeah. mad. So tons and tons of um, video and audio work going on um, for a virtual summer festival mm. um, that we're doing in on this Saturday this week. Yeah. Uh, so obviously that falls down to us to put together because. Well, doesn't it? That's an interesting thing though, because um, that summer festival, under normal circumstances, obviously takes place in an outdoors venue. Mm -hmm. So it's it's. Uh, it's a full-on festival with a number of stages, lots of performers, and it really goes on all day. So it's an all-day event. That's all right. It's so rather than cancelling that this year, um, that whole festival went online, and now you know will uh, will premiere on YouTube. Um, and I think you know just just generally, I think it's an amazing feat to put all that together and actually to make that happen. It's just it's incredible. Well, it is. And I think in overall man hours, it's probably it's less to do this. Right. But mm. for us being the the techie related people, <laughs> that's yeah. unfortunately the hours that are left fall fall down to us to, to collate all that together. Yeah. Um, so just for simplicity's sake, what's really happening, right, is that um the the kids that we teach that are you know you know playing the orchestras and the training mm. groups that we've got they are recording their individual parts at home to a click track or a backing track in headphones S filming themselves at the same time it comes to us and it's our job to put the audio together put the video together and to make it look good and be mm. fun for them to watch and something that they're able to do on you know this coming saturday without um being able to do it in person yeah so you know i What's so great about this is no one else is doing this in well, to the level that we're going to, and I love that. Yeah, no matter how much work's involved. But it's it's amazing because it, you know it's always the easiest thing to do is it always is to do nothing. Yeah, and I think you know to uh, just to make the decision to say like, well, actually, hang on a minute, you know, we we're gonna find a way of of making this happen, and it may not be in the way that we're used to because we can't. Um, but instead, we're going to find we're going to find an alternative way of of putting that festival together mm -hmm. and uh, and doing it in this way. Um, it's you know it's it's an incredibly creative way of, uh, of of putting this together. I mean, if you imagine orchestral performances where the performers record themselves on their phones, um, you know, at home individually. And then for all of that to be put together and synced together and, you know, uh, for the audio to be mixed so it actually sounds like an orchestral performance or like a band. It's not only orchestras, it's also, you know, all sorts of different groups like big bands and um, and bands and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, but to put that together and actually make it sound, you know, like a live orchestral performance is that's quite yeah. remarkable really it is and you know that's it's not easy to do mm. um but it is doable and we are doing it and mm. it's you know, i have to say it sounds great it's looking great mm. and you know could it look better oh it can all there's all it can always be better right mm. but in the time frame that we've got i think yeah. we're putting out we're going to be putting out something that's pretty spectacular and there are over 20 items on our program yeah. So it's a lot of with up to of sixty different. performers on a couple of those yeah, tracks exactly. as well. So, <sighs> but if you just add up how many parts, how many musical parts that are, or how many instrumental oh, parts that are, it's incredible. I don't want to think about so, that. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, not not only from a from a technical perspective of putting that together and editing it and syncing it and all the rest of it, but also the amount of people that are involved in in uh, in making that happen and all the little contributions that every single person makes to it. 
for it to then come together and and create this you know the whole the, yeah. the final performance is just you know it's mind boggling and it just goes to show how even in the face of adversity um, with something like coronavirus or lockdown or whatever you know there's always a way to make creative things happen and to be creative and I yeah. think that's that's the thing that I love about it you know it's because it would have been so easy to just say well it's cancelled yeah. we're not doing it yeah it would have been the easiest thing to to do and yet um, you know we're we're really pulling every little drip drop of talent out of this to make this happen. So it's yeah, it's fantastic. It's you great. Know? And I do know that you know, I haven't talked to um, a lot, of the, lot of the students already that they love the idea of that we're doing it. You know, yeah, is it ideal? No, it's no. not. Much rather perform live and for do sure. it in person. Of course, this is a close second um, yeah. for what we've got, and they love it. And I know yeah. the teachers are as well. There's a lot of work on their part. Yeah. But they, they love doing it. And also, I'm already looking forward to next year's festival, provided everything goes back to, you know, mm, more or less crossed. noble. But just imagine what kind of festival that's going to be. <laughs> that's going to be insane. <laughs> it's going to be immense. Yeah. So, you know, so uh, so I think it's it's worth spending every living, breathing second of our lives just yeah. getting this done yeah. right now. So. so so that's why I'm looking rather tired yeah. right now. Yeah, tell me about uh, it. But on a, on a um, you know, that is all all positive. You know, on the negative side, yes, it uh, makes me very, very tired. On another positive, heck up. Ah, yeah. Because awesome. I'm worth it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, finally. <laughs> nice. Finally. I, I don't go any shorter. Because it right. felt really weird when I was in this. I, I, I cut it a bit longer than you normally yeah. would. And what was that experience like? Was that like full visor and like the whole? Shebang? So I didn't have to wear anything. Uh, right. I could have, obviously. No. Um, I I chose not to, um, but because all the all of the staff were wearing full on, you know, full face shields. Mm. Um, there was sanitizer everywhere. People were there weren't as, nearly as many clients in there as they would normally have, right. and all of that that kind of stuff. Um, they've got screens in between the different sort of, well, mm. stations. I can't, I'm not no. sure what that word would be, but whatever they are. Um, so, yeah, they were doing everything they possibly could to keep it as, mm. you know, as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, That's fine. I know some uh, some friends of mine, they, took their, they, they got into their barbers as well, but that was different. They were forced to wear a mask oh, really? they had to. And, oh, wow. you know, I can understand that from a barber's perspective as well. They're also wearing face shields. So it's... Yeah, I yeah. think everybody's doing what they can in that that environment. Yeah, I, I do think that things have to kind of start up again. You know, it's um, who knows what kind of effect, what kind of long term effect um, all this is going to mm. have on you know the economy and just people's sanity or whatever. You know, so I think it's important. Um, it's also important to make things as safe as possible. Yeah, you know, um, I don't even know what a hairdresser looks like. Under normal circumstances, since I haven't been oh, in twenty five years, is true. <laughs> so you know, I could tell you what it was like a quarter of a century ago. Yeah, but um, yeah, but that, last time you were in a hairdresser's, there it was proper barbers, you know, long mustaches, you know, curl, curled at the end and whatnot, no doubt. Hey man, scissors hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. All doing barbershop constantly, <laughs> I'm sure. Why are constantly singing? Are you? <laughs> I expect no less. <laughs> well, so um, so it's a busy week. Um, yep. But it was a good week. Um, it's not, it's not going to change anytime soon. I think. Um, so maybe in in next week's podcast, you know, for those of uh, our viewers who are followers on on YouTube, they'll be able to see our haggard faces. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm going to age this week for sure. Yeah, even more gray. Oh, it's not gray. It's actually, um, it's silver. So, that so that we going with silver? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the color of wisdom. The color of wisdom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I told my daughter because my, my daughter uh, the other day she said to me, "Yeah, daddy." You're getting more gray hairs. And I'm like, it's not gray, it's silver. It's, it's you know, they're wisdom hairs. Like, you know, wisdom teeth? It's the same thing. <laughs> she bought that, did she? Uh, yeah. Good. Of course she did. Good. Like, she also still buys the whole story of Santa Claus. Oh. Yeah, I think. Maybe. I might be, she might just be making it up. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. She probably is. She's pretty smart. But, you know, for years I worked, because I, um, I have a number saved under, uh, under Santa Claus, in my or under Santa in my phone, and uh, whenever, you know, when, whenever I had to kind of threaten her, um, I would sort of pull that up on the contact. And I'm like, yeah, if you don't go to bed in the next five minutes, I'm gonna have to call Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and just showing her, she goes, you know. And then at one point, it was like, oh no, you don't really, you can't really call Santa. I'll just pull up my phone and be like, 
I can. Mm -hmm. And that worked. Straight nice. Away. Yeah, it's worked for years. Now she's nine. I'm thinking we might be coming to the end of that. I'm pretty sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's this funny thing going on. Whenever I mention this, you know, I just, whenever I mention this to her, I look at her, look at my wife, and I can see this going on. <laughs> that kind of tells me something's up. Oh, so for those of you listening to the audio version of this, yeah. the person just did a wink. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wink of the eye. That's what's happening there. So yeah, yeah. So that's uh, yeah, my dreams will be shattered. <laughs> yeah, it's always a. It's 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 one of these things, you know, when your kids grow up and they stop believing in Santa Claus, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like the next thing when I don't know they, you know, it's like they go out with their friends on their own. You know, and then God forbid they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something like that. That's, you know, that's particularly tough to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for years, I managed to keep that um, at bay by uh, writing ukulele songs for said boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're that parent. Aren't I you? am that yeah. parent. Yeah. All the way through. We have a vetting process in our mm -hmm. house. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. yeah, it's very difficult to pass that. Wow. And, you know, I haven't seen a boyfriend at the house yet. <laughs> so it seems, to, it seems to be working. <laughs> oh, your poor children. <laughs> I know. I know. But anyway, I came across uh, something else um, uh, this week, which made me laugh out loud. Wow. In fact, you, you actually lolled. I did loll. Yes. It actually, in fact, it had me in stitches. So, um, so, uh, I came across this story of uh, this photographer called Sandro Miller. Okay. Right. And what he did was he recreated famous portrait images. And okay. that in itself is not necessarily some, you know, it's not necessarily very unusual because I've, you know, I've seen that sort of thing done before. Yeah. Um, you know, where somebody takes like, I don't know, some of the great masters and some of the great paintings and recreates that in, 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 a, in a photograph or something like that. But Sandra Miller basically took, you know, uh, timeless, very famous portrait images like Che Guevara, for example, mm -hmm. you know, or that famous image of Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he recreated those, all featuring John Malkovich. <laughs> 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 and I have to say, <laughs> his photographs are stunning. Wow. I mean, it's not a case of him just, you know, photoshopping John Malkovich's face in, in, into a famous portrait image. It's actually, each image is a, a separate individual photo shoot with John Malkovich made up to look like, you know, Che Guevara or um, uh, this is uh, the, the famous uh, Annie Leibovitz uh, shot of John Lennon and Yoko Ono, mm -hmm. that one where they're both naked, so I think. Um, or uh, what else? So, so, wait, so he actually had... Shot this with John Malkovich. Yes, he did. Isn't yes. the in any way? Nope. Absolutely. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know what I love more. The fact, oh, I, I mean, the idea, I love the idea. But the fact that John Malkovich was up for it. Yeah. It's just, that just boggles my mind. I mean, that's, that, that's you bizarre. know, a major street cred to JM for that because um, that is, I mean, again, you know, from a creative perspective, I just think it's an incredible idea, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, but but that being said... Oh, whoa, whoa, sorry. Just before you continue, because it's just right. striking me now. We uh, <laughs> Are we seeing John Malkovich naked now? Uh, yeah, I mean... In his John Lennon shoot? Well, so... Get this. So there's a there's a. Um, I, I love John Malkovich. I'm not sure I want to see that though. Oh well, there's. Do you remember? Um, there's a very famous uh, Marilyn Monroe um, shoot uh, of her in like pink. Um, was it pink roses or something like that? Okay. Um, it's it's a Bert Stern shot, um, and John Malkovich, basically. I mean, they basically uh, they recreate this shoot with uh, this this photo with uh, this portrait with John Malkovich dressed up as Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's uh, it's oh. incredible. But the, the thing um, that I found the most striking in this is that he really managed to um, really faithfully recreate the lighting and, um, you know, the posing and the composition mm -hmm. and everything. I mean, these photos are really, really good. 
the the incredible portrait photos. That famous uh, he re he recreated that famous um uh that uh what is it the, I can't remember the the original uh, photographer. But there's a famous photo of Salvatore Dali. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So um you know that's one um uh he did um what else did you oh um there's a famous Andy Warhol self portrait um which, which he kind of you know uh, recreated uh, the list is endless i think there's 35 oh. uh portraits in total and you know if you think that, that those are 35 photo shoots that john Markovich must have been available for <laughs> it's just it's incredible um what what an idea well, i assume they did this all over lockdown i don't know when that, that period of time i want to i want to think that that was probably uh that was probably um uh, created before lockdown oh, okay so okay. um but uh, i don't really know how how far back that shoot goes it's just i came across it mm. um, very recently and it was just one of these things where you know i'm always up for stuff like that that's i, I find that is uh, one of these things that really um puts fun into photography yeah for sure you know that's it's such a it's such a fun thing to do and don't you think you need balls of steel to approach john malkovich and say like oh i've got this idea yeah i want you to uh to pretend you're marilyn monroe oh my god <laughs> i've just got this picture in my head now of do you remember the um the film poster for being john malkovich oh love it where you know it's him yeah. Oh, God knows how many times. I'm kind of seeing all these shots that he's taken now in that, just put all together on that film poster yeah, instead. Yeah. And he, oh, that'd be immense. Yeah, I'd yeah. love that. Yeah, that's a great movie, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's actually, to be honest, that goes straight into my Netflix, you know, viewing list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I haven't thought about that movie in a while. But no, yeah, me either. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good idea. I'm looking for movies. If anybody's got any suggestions for cool movies for me to watch, um, put them either in the comments below or email us at camerashakepodcast at gmail.com uh, with any suggestions you may have. Or you can um, post on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash camerashakepodcast. Nice. And uh, just, um, just let me know if you've got any Netflix viewing suggestions or Disney Plus. Oh, Disney Plus. Oh, Disney yeah, Plus. You're one of them now. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Totally bought into that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, old John Malkovich film. Um, did you ever see Empire of the Sun? Um, yes, I did. Uh, Christian Bale? Yeah, yes. as a kid. As a yeah. kid, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Quality film. Yeah, it's great. Love that film. Steven Spielberg, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, I remember the uh, the flyover, like the, um, the uh, was it Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Flyover scene. For years, you couldn't get that over here on DVD. Could you not? No. Why not? You could only get it on Region 1. Really? Yeah, I tried. Is there For a years I tried. I, I don't know. No idea. So I bought it on Region 1. Thankfully, I had a, a code to fit into my DVD player at the time, and uh, it played it. That's weird. Yeah. I wonder what the reason for that is. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Hmm. I'm sure it got released after that, but... Yeah. yeah. Odd. Remember, that's... Um, how, how long does that movie go back? I mean, that's, that oh, must God. be late 80s? Yeah, something Mid -80s, like that. Mid 80s. Yeah. Like yeah. I remember watching it when I was, you know, sort of 10 so and that was in early 90s mm. yeah. well there's supposedly there's a Kurt Cobain documentary coming out at some point I think it's been in the making for the last five years or something I keep seeing things on YouTube and I'm never really sure whether it's like a fan you know like one oh, of these yeah. fan videos or something or not um, and again, if anybody can clue me up on that, that'd be interesting. <laughs> it's got the potential to be excellent. That's also got the potential to be terrible, trash. Yeah. Mm. Maybe we should call John Markovich to see if he wants to play Kurt Cobain. Ah, yeah, he could. See, yeah, there's an idea. Yeah, like it. Right. So just keep that in your hands, John Markovich as Kurt Cobain. So before we get to speak to June's competition winner, uh, let's just have a quick chat about this month's mm -hmm. July competition, because as every month we've decided to do um, a public competition. Um, last month it was pets and animals. Yeah. This month it's going to be landscapes. Mm -hmm. So if you have an awesome landscape image or several landscape images, please send them in to us. You can uh, send them in via email. Um, that would be camerashakepodcast at gmail.com 
or you can uh, you can send them over via Facebook. We're on facebook.com forward slash camera shake podcast. You can print them out and tie them to the leg of a pigeon and send them over to us in any way, shape or form. If you can get your images to us, uh, we would love to see them. So landscapes is what we're talking about. Um, that could be absolutely anything. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing some images. Yeah, we were super surprised to have such a great response um, to to the June competition. Now, that was incredible. If we get the same kind of response this month, I will be absolutely delighted. Absolutely, yeah. And if we get the quality of images that we got last time yeah. as well, wow. That was incredible. Such a range of images. Yeah. I mean, everything from like, you know, really fun, hilariously funny uh, images to incredibly well shot, um, yeah. you know, photos like, like our, our winning photo. Um, but it was so tough. To uh, to pick a winner in the end because um, you know we had uh, some some fantastic uh, images. Um, I think Lloyd's image um, of the dog, yeah, you know, the, the dog walking that was uh, that was just an incredible shot. Um, and there were so many others that you know could have quite easily won on any other day. There was there was a range of images that could have could have won that, but as it happens on that particular day. Uh, Brian Duke's image of the uh, of the chimpanzee just totally stole the show. Exactly. So now it's time for our June competition winner. Please welcome Mr. Brian Dukes on the show. Brian, how are you doing? Hi, thank you very much. I'm I'm good, thank you. Cool. So just as a bit of a recap, last month we had a photo competition going, and um, the the topic or the theme of that competition was pets and animals. And we had lots of entries, um, and it was really quite difficult to uh, to find the winner um, in this. Do you, do you mm -hmm. agree with it? Yeah, it was difficult. There's so many good entries, and so nice. many more entries than we were expecting. As yeah, well. oh, for sure. We literally expected one photo. Yeah. <laughs> we thought, like, oh, we're happy <laughs> we got, with... You got five from me. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, we, we would have been happy with, like, just one photo. But actually, um, it, yeah, I was thrilled to see that many mm, photos. Yeah. Especially, um, you know... the. Like the the width and breadth of um, of different types of animal photos that came in was really yeah. quite amazing. There's some real pro pro photos that came in, yeah. you know, like yours, Brian. Um, and then we had some uh, iPhone photos as well, which was interesting. Yeah, and with some really fun shots. So it was a you know there was there was a great variety of different photos. Mm. So some were really goofy fun shots, like that horse. Oh, what yeah, was up that with that was horse? Good. Yeah, <laughs> there was a shot of a horse. Um, with like a close-up shot with its mouth open, it looked like it was straight out of some cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Um, so we had, you know, we had those kind of shots. Um, but but then we had some really really clever uh, photographs. Um, and and of course, uh, we had your shot, the uh, the shot of a, or the photo of a chimpanzee, which I thought which was, wasn't clever. <laughs> well, it was just I thought it was uh, it was fantastic. It was like. It was like a classic, moody, black and white portrait, but then it was a, chimp a chimpanzee. So, uh, yeah. you know, it was, uh, the lighting on it was, was amazing. I thought the way that you lit the eyes there, and we'll talk about how you did it um, in just a second, but um, mm -hmm. it was really, it was just uh, mesmerizing. I think that's the- uh, It that's was, and there were two th key things that we picked out, wasn't it? The lighting that was on it and your ability to capture a moment where that chimpanzee was looking the way he was looking. Yeah, he, you know, yeah. It was just his eyes told us told a story. That's that's not easy to do. That no. takes some patience as yeah. well. Yeah, that's that's the thing. There was a real connection there. I think with the yeah. eyes. So that was that was the first thing. Um, I think when that came up um, on the screen for me, it was the first thing I I was drawn to were the eyes, and it was um, you know it was, it was really quite a, mm -hmm. quite a stunning shot. So congratulations for winning the June competition. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Well, um, I'll, I'll send you the address for the check later on. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, so tell us a little bit about the photo. How how did this uh, photo come about? So the photo was taken at a visit uh, last year, around August of last year, at uh, Monkey World in Dorset. And I've visited Monkey World now five or six times, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and each time you get to see some of the same animals and some of the, some very different animals because it depends whether they're hiding away or um or they're actually out and, and quite happy to see people and 
And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, uh, it depends how many children are running around screaming as to how, how many animals go off hiding. Mm. Um, but the thing I like about Monkey World is a lot of the monkeys there, they're, they're pretty much all rescued monkeys. The monkeys that have had a really hard life. So you, you say a, a, about the eyes telling a story, mm. you know, you, you don't know what the story is behind these monkeys. Some of these monkeys have had a absolutely an, an awful, cruel life. Um, you know, they, they're, they're either ex-circus monkeys oh. or, or they, they've been from rich families that have just neglected them or they've just been mistreated in, in, in their habitats. Mm. Um, and some of the orangutans uh, that they have there have been sort of ousted from, the, from their habitats because of, of, of the um, sort of palm oil being planted everywhere at the moment. So a, a lot of the animals there are rescue animals or, or they come from other zoos that just uh, can't deal with these particular animals so every single monkey there has a story to tell i can't remember the exact um, story from this particular monkey i do find it very difficult sometimes when you have 15 chimpanzees jumping around in in their uh, sort of compound area to try and identify which ones they have from a very grainy photograph that they put on the outside of the um, the areas there um, and this particular photograph was taken through one of the areas where you walk through a very darkly lit uh, corridor. You've got some massive glass screens, which are obviously dirty and scratched uh, and all the rest of it. And there's a sort of nice, slightly lighter light, lighter area inside, which um, you, you can see where they're playing. But it's more of the sort of safe zone for them. Mm. They can't see too many of the visitors walking by. Um, and they can get to play and rest in their straw and, and, and have their food and whatever there. So it's a nice safe zone for them, and, and you do see they're often a little bit calmer in there. So taking this photograph was really just a case of finding a good position, making sure I pushed all the children out of the way so I can get to see a bit of the glass, get my camera right up against the glass, and just waiting, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and sometimes you'll sit there for an hour and nothing will happen. Mm. And then other times it can happen in, in a few seconds. And sometimes after an hour, I might go away and go visit somewhere else and then come back again and sit there for another hour. Um, this particular one, I, again, I can't recall. I don't think I was waiting anywhere near an hour for this particular shot. But um, it sort of happened uh, in camera. And uh, you know, when I, when I looked back at the image, it was one of probably 20 or so images of this particular uh, chimpanzee that I took. Mm. And uh, the original image was just totally black. Um, it was hugely unex underexposed. Um, I had a little play with Lightroom and saw that there was actually a really good image behind it. And that's where I, I, I took my sort of inspiration from. Um, in terms of um, the lighting, most of the lighting there is, is going to be natural. I can't go there with any flash. Um, as much as I would love to to set up a flash and yes. you know get get the chimpanzee sort of centered and you know get all my lights set up and everything, get there with a light meter and take all these settings and get the perfect portrait. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can't get anywhere near the chimpanzees for a start. And you know these. As I say, all of these chimpanzees have had a really hard life, so the last thing you want to do is start flashing a, a studio light at them. I'm guessing flash photography wouldn't be allowed in a, in a zoo, like in an indoors area of a zoo anyway, huh? Not, not, not ordinarily, no. And, and to be honest, a lot of zoos are, are pretty anti-commercial photographers coming around. I, I'm a hobbyist, um, so from that respect, whilst I might walk around with a big lens and a nice big camera, um, I'm just a hobbyist. I'm not doing anything with these images apart from putting them on yeah. Facebook and, and making them look pretty. Are you are you allowed to use a tripod in there or not? You are. You are. Uh, as long as it doesn't get in anybody's way, but you could walk around with a tripod. I don't tend to because, again, shooting wildlife uh, at, at zoos and wildlife parks, you, you need to have a really fast shutter speed anyway. Uh, so generally speaking, you're above... Uh, two hundredths of a second. Uh, this particular shot was really quite slow. It was one one hundredth of a, one. Sorry, one one twenty fifth of a second. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, out in the field, you're, you're dealing with two hundred, four hundred, six hundredths of a second. So fast speed. You don't really need a tripod for that. You can quite happily handhold that. What kind of focal length do you use for for these sort of shots? 
They give um, you an this this particular shot was uh, 200 millimeters, so I was using a 70 to 200 uh, f4 mm. uh, with this one. Um, I recently got myself a, a 200 to 600, mm. um, and and that's just brilliant. Um, I took that out fairly recently, and um, you know it is a beautiful uh, lens to use. Uh, but generally, around about 200 is pretty good for that. In an indoor setting like this, I would probably shoot even shorter than that. Mm. Um, and, and I'm surprised now when I'm looking at the metadata that that um, image wasn't done at, uh, at the, uh, the the shorter end of that uh, range. But it's, what was interesting, I think, uh, was that you said uh, this shot was one of a series of shots that you took. Um, and I think, I mean, this, this really reminds me very much of, you know, portrait photography uh, where you know, you'll pick the best out of a series mm -hmm. of shots. Um, and it could be, you know, sometimes it could be 20, sometimes it could be 200, you know, sometimes yep. it could be 600. <laughs> you know, who knows? Isn't, isn't that the beauty of uh, digital photography now? You can just keep on pressing that shutter. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, last, we had a guest on um, last week, um, Scott Johnson. We talked to him, we talked to him about uh, film photography. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it still surprised me how expensive film is these days. You know, mm. it's like, what was it? Four pounds, 80 per shot, huh? Yeah, oh, something like that. Wow, can you imagine? Just... You, you you need to know it's going to be perfect before you press the shutter. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's um what do you shoot on, Brian? So I've got a Sony uh, A seven R three at the moment. Um, I used to shoot with Canon. Okay. Um, and I'd slowly upgraded myself from a started off with a Canon five hundred D, which was pretty basic crop sensor uh, camera. Um, then I moved to a six D Mark one which I really loved actually. Um, and then I moved on to a, a, a 5D Mark IV. And for some reason, I just couldn't get on with the 5D Mark IV, even though it was superior in focusing uh, points and, and everything uh, over the um, 6D. Um, and I kept on switching back to the 6D. So I decided to, uh, to, to make the mirrorless move. And uh, mm -hmm. at that point in time, uh, Sony had something out there that was really good. Uh, Canon hadn't really entered the mirrorless market at that point either. Um, and with the eye autofocus ability of the um, of the A7R R3, um, it was just amazing. And then literally one firmware upgrade in, they released the uh, animal eye autofocus oh, yeah. as well, which mm. is, is absolutely brilliant. It does work. It does work on wild animals, not just cats and dogs. Um, it doesn't always work, but but most times it does work. Yeah. I've, I've even had it sharpen, uh, you know, hit the focus point on a rhino uh, before now. And so, you know, even when you can only see one eye, it will it will actually do autofocus wow. on it. So, and again, with something like a chimpanzee, where where their features are more human and their eyes are, are, are front and center, um, it, it's it's really sharp on those. So I had no issues at all focusing on the eyes of this particular chimp so with the um with the r5 and the r6 coming out um are you tempted to go back to canon or are you happily shooting with sony i now? i I've, i think i've invested now in sony right. and sony were ahead of the game and i think they're still ahead of the game and you know of, although obviously uh canon have just released that camera sure. um you know, I think Sony will still be ahead of the game. Um, you know, they've got more to come yet. You know, I, I, <laughs> this is what three three thousand pounds worth of camera just sat here. I've got, I've got to carry on using it for a few more years before I can can't consider upgrading it as a hobbyist. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult uh, switching systems because you you invest so much money into mm -hmm. like glass and you know bodies. It's glass, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's um, really what's kept me with uh, with Nikon so far. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm just yeah. going to hang out in that system for a bit. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was a very expensive move from Canon. Um, and at one point, um, I tried to use an adapter to to see if I could use the Canon lenses on on the on the Sony body, but it just didn't work out for me. Yeah. And especially with um, wildlife photography, where you need to have that slightly faster shutter speed, it just really slowed everything down. Yeah. So uh, I decided to sell all of my uh, Canon lenses. I think I had about five of them at the time and then slowly replaced them uh, on, on the Sony range. Mm -hmm. The Sony lenses are quite expensive. Yeah. So what other animals do you like? Uh, do you f do you photograph? So I, I seem to uh, photograph an awful lot of zebras and I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a black and white horse, right? <laughs> 
Um, but uh, the, my, I guess my other favourite is rhinos, just because they're they, they're quite prehistoric looking and they are very majestic animals. Yeah. You know, they they don't do anybody any harm. They yeah. just plod along and just look brilliant. And you know, there's a ton of detail there. You can never get you know, you'll never see a smooth rhino. So there's always lots of detail yeah. there. So for photography, they're just brilliant and yeah. they they stand pretty still as well. Yeah. I did when uh, my daughter was two, uh, we went to uh, we went to a zoo and it was a rhino in an enclosure and mm. uh, she comes running out to me. She goes, Daddy, Daddy, I've just seen a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? So well, uh, yeah, it turns out, turns out to be a rhino. But yeah, I mean, I can see how she thought that. It will, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it did look yeah. quite dinosaur-ish. <laughs> dinosaur-ish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, again, you know, big cats are always a, a good favorite as well. Yeah. So, you know, sort of lions, tigers, cheetahs, that sort of thing. They're always good. Yeah. Good to see. They're just really hard to photograph in zoos because they're quite uh, sedentary in zoos. Right. They like to sleep up against a fence, which, you know, instantly you, you can't photograph uh, when they're up against a fence. Um, and Or they'll go off and hide in the middle of their compound areas and you just can't see them at all. So mm. get a, get in a... A, a, a lion or a tiger to walk around and, and do things you've just got to find the right time of day to do that and, and that's just luck of the draw really with those sorts of shots until I can get to Africa yeah. <laughs> that'd be the thing to do I think okay so Brian you come from an art background um, tell us a little bit about that so <laughs> Uh, art background might be a bit strong, but um, I've had art, I guess, throughout my, my schooling. Um, throughout school, um, I was very good at drawing and painting and, and pottery, especially a major in, in, in pottery. Uh, when I went off to college, again, I, I did art at college. So again, drawing and painting, uh, tried a little bit of photography at college. But again, I just at that point in time, coming from a, a council estate background, I didn't have any money at all, mm. couldn't afford a decent camera. Um, so um, I had very limited input into photography at that point. And I tried to do different things. So I tried to push different media. So I was actually doing some drawing at um, a college that was using uh, sort of 3D glasses. So I was drawing in red and blue colors to, mm. to try and create 3D shapes freehand, um, just to try and experiment with a different media. Did that work? And also, it, it worked really well for oh, my, really? my, wow. my, my um, tutors were like, no, no, you can't enter that. You, you can't use that. Uh, they just wouldn't accept it. Um, you know, they're very, very old school there. You know, you need to go off and study art history. You need to, mm -hmm. to study the old masters yeah. and all this sort of thing, um, which I found quite limiting. And uh, I was also painting a lot of murals as well. So in my bedroom at the time, I painted lots of uh, album covers and record covers right. from various um, mm. uh, artists. And I got commissioned a couple of times by some neighbors to do their children's bedrooms and take um, um, images out of storybooks and paint those. So I was always painting and drawing for, for quite a, a bit of my life up until the point where I was a, a young adult. And then it kind of just stopped, I guess. Mm. Um, Although I always had that interest, and, and when my children were young, I painted their bedrooms, painted a full 360-degree mural around their, their bedroom. Mm. Um, but again, haven't done anything like that for a while. Um, and then I think it was about just 15 years ago, I kind of had my first touch with a camera again, um, other than the, the sort of regular Instamatics to just do holiday snaps. Um, and then kind of progressed from that point and, and then got a real interest for it. And, and again, I think when I had my first iPhone, which at that point was an iPhone 3S, I just started taking photographs of anything and everything. You know, or well, there's an interesting piece of concrete snap and, you know, there, there's a flower snap and there's a <laughs> yeah. bit of moss snap. And, you know, I guess everybody goes through that stage, you know, just snapping everything and, and, and just trying to find a composition in everything. And for me, one of the things that I think I always stay true to in, in whatever I produce is trying to find the art in, in an image. You, you know, you mentioned earlier that this looked like a, a, an old painting. Well, that's exactly what that image of that chimpanzee wanted. I wanted it to look like. Mm. And a lot of my sort of single um, image, uh, single animal uh, co compositions are about trying to create something that's a, an everlasting image that people would be proud to look at every day 
and I would be proud to look at every day. So, you know, for me, it's always about finding the art uh, for, yeah. first and foremost in this. And I, I, you know, I've tried my hand at various genres of uh, photography. I've had a go at street photography. I've had a go at mountain bike photography. And whilst I've managed to get some really good images, I just can't see the art in these images. It's not, it's not what I see appealing. Mm. You know, I, I like a ton of stuff on the internet. I like a, a whole bunch of other things and other people's images. But for me, it just doesn't create art. It's just not the sort of image I would want hanging on my wall. Yeah. And, and if I don't want it hanging on my wall, I don't, I can't expect anybody to want it hanging on their wall. Um, and that's, that seems to be my sort of driving force with the photography that I'm doing at the moment. Mm. Well, it's interesting what you said there, because I always, um, I always tell people that it's important to shoot with intent. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that you intentionally create a photograph rather than just you know snapping. Um, yeah, definitely. And uh, and I think that's really important because it it does really teach you how to look at a scene and uh, and and sometimes how to manipulate the environment to create the photo that you can see in your in your mind. Nine times out of ten, what you see in your mind and what the final photo is in the end might not necessarily be the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's usually going to be better because you know because you've shot with intent from the start, rather than you know just hoping for the best. And it's this thing I think as you get better at photography, um, and as you you know get better at at your art form, you start to see things in a different light, quite literally. You know where you literally you look at the light and how something slid and where the light's coming from, what the intensity is, you know how soft or hard the light is, and. Mm -hmm. And just by looking at a, a scene like that, that allows you to manipulate things like you can move a model. For instance, if you're for instance, if you're shooting people, you know, even just in a in a natural light situation, you can move somebody to a diff to different a different angle or angle the head differently or turn the head or move them to a different part of a window and so on and so forth. It's just you know it gets you to the point where you can see something before you take the shot, rather than Indeed. just hitting the shutter button and just hoping for the best. And, you know, when you yeah. look at the photo in the end, you can go, oh, well, that doesn't, you know, that didn't come out. I think your hit rate is going to be much higher that way. It, absolutely. Um, if, if only it were that easy in, in a zoo setting. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say if it's only, easy. If only, <laughs> if only you could encourage the animal to come, just come forward a little bit. Well, so the, lungs, the, the, the sun's coming through there yeah, and, you know, it, it's difficult. You, a lot of the times that you, you go into a zoo or a wildlife park, you, you, what's in front of you is what you've got to play with but you said earlier that um you you wait for quite a long time for something to happen i think that's what makes the difference um mm -hmm. i for for my part um i'm not very much of a landscape photographer and one i think one of the reasons for that is is that i'm quite impatient <laughs> and here i speak to landscape and, and i look up to um i have a lot of friends who are phenomenal landscape photographers and, you know, I always look at their photographs and I, I always think like, I wish I could produce that kind of, yeah. you know, that kind of material. But of course, the reality is I don't have the patience to sit in the field for six hours. No, you know? no. <laughs> and, and I also don't, I just can't seem to get myself up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go no, and no, like, I, watch the no. sun. So I know what's, what it takes to create these photographs, but it's just at this stage it's not that's not me in a sense so mm -hmm. um but it's you know what, what i mean by by manipulating the frame it's like sometimes if you can't manipulate manipulate your model sometimes you just have to wait and sit it out and wait for it you know wait for the wait for the the light to change wait for the sun to change um if you're you know if you're taking a picture of a particular i don't know of a landscape or something like that or yeah. in your in your case you just had to be patient to wait for the animal to move to the spot that you decide is going to be the right spot, you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah. uh, I think that's, it really takes a photographer's eye to identify that before and then know, you know, now is the time. I, th I think, I think the sort of wow moment that I had was, um, probably about 10 years ago now. And I was up in the Welsh mountain zoo mm -hmm. up in Wales um lovely little zoo and nice big compound areas and a really interesting sort of setup where you kind of park in the middle of the zoo and you can always go back to your car if you need to uh, and it's just really nice and relaxed zoo and they had a group of chimpanzees 
the observation area was a, a, a very thick glass screen, um, and the the chimps were playing in their in their thing, jumping off their swings and and all the usual things that chimps do. And it must have been sort of lunchtime, and they were getting called in for for their food, and pretty much all of them went in straight away. And this last one kind of came along the grass, sat at the edge of the grass by 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 the concrete path, just paused a little bit and kind of huddled himself a little bit like this and just looked out. And for that moment, then I kind of saw a completely different image, a, a certain vulnerability of a of an animal. And, and and as I pressed the shutter, in my mind's eye, I saw this image of him being in a dark room on his own, you know, completely vulnerable. And when I got at home, you know, again, it was with 500D, so it wasn't a great camera. Uh, <laughs> image was a little bit grainy. It wasn't, it wasn't brilliant. But I took the chimpanzee out of that setting of being on the grass in bright sunshine, and I put him on a background, back on a black background, sat him in the corner, the bottom corner, lots of black empty space there, um, to, in lots of negative space, and just changed the lighting. And that just completely and utterly changed the sense. And mm. for me, that was the wow moment there. You know, I was out, out there in the field. I would had an idea for a, an image. I'd taken a shot and I'd been able to come back home and actually create that shot, mm. even though I couldn't get it in camera. So you you're also a model. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell tell us a little bit about your modeling career. So um, I've I've been helping out a fellow uh, photographer, um, a, a guy called Glenn Dewis, um, who I met on a lighting course. He was actually producing a lighting course. Um, probably six, seven years ago now. Um, and I wanted to learn about studio lights. I wanted to learn how, how to how to light things and, and how to use studio lights. And he did this two day course and I met him over in Aylesbury and we got on really well. And since then we've been really good friends. So very cheekily, I I said to him, you know, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody. I, I'm a, just a hobbyist at the moment. Can I come out with you on some shoots? Can I come and help you? Can I come and just carry your bags in, do these sorts of things just to help and to learn? And he's like, yeah, come along. So quite often what he's done is whilst he's setting up, he's going, well, you sit in that chair and I'll set up the lights around you and then I'll take some test shots to make sure I've got the lighting right. Then we can get the real model in. So some of these images um, were, were, were taken in that way. Um, and that's great. And some of, and, and obviously he's a brilliant photographer, so he's managed to make me look absolutely amazing. Uh, but also he he did one particular shoot of uh, he wanted to uh, emulate a, a Jarvis Cocker uh, image of Jarvis with uh, lots of icicles on his beard, very sort of classic image. So yeah, so we went into this boxing gym owned by world cam uh, champion kickboxer um, Stephen Cook. Uh, his upstairs area was completely empty and blinking well cold as well, which was just as well. Um, we had a makeup artist on, on site. Um, she was applying uh, icicles to me, which were uh, very expensive sort of hair gel, sort of film grade hair gel. And we produced this, this image here. Oh, wow. wow. Nice. That's amazing. Um, which, which, as you can tell, has been used in his book. Um, so yeah, so um, I've, I've done my little bit of uh, modeling, um, which um, I, I quite enjoy. And for me, being on the other side of the camera teaches me just as much as being in front of the camera. You know, there's a lot to learn from being sat there and watching the photographer and also receiving those messages from the photographer to, you know, just mm. look this way, look that way and mm -hmm. whatever's needed. Um, so again, I've been trying to 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 do some human photography. I don't think I'm particularly good at it and I don't think I ever will be good at it, but you know, I've been trying to do those little bits where I can um, just to see if there is something that I would like to do. I think I'm very, very much a, an animal photographer. Yeah, so the thing about portrait phot photography uh, when it comes to shooting humans, um, it's very much down to communication. Mm -hmm. You know, I always think like, every, you know, anybody can take a pretty picture, um, but communicating with the person that you're photographing, that's really an art form. Um, and I've, yep. I mean, for me, that, you know, I think that was probably the, uh, the biggest stumbling block 
uh, when it came to portrait photography, because because really the trick is to make to make your model um, feel really comfortable in front of the yeah. camera, and that's in a way you know that's easy when you're fo- when you're photographing a professional model, but when you're photographing just you know an average Joe like an mm-hmm. everyday person, then yeah. that's a, that's a completely different ballgame because you know Indeed. under normal circumstances people are not necessarily comfortable in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. And so it's just making somebody, you know, comfortable and relaxed. That's a really, you know, that's a difficult, difficult thing. And of course, people are different. I find it with headshot photography all the time because, you know, you end up photographing people from all sorts of uh, walks of life. And, and it's, you know, it's important to kind of get into um, you're getting them to talk about themselves and, you know, Mm-hmm. Eventually, once you got them at the point where uh, where they where they feel relaxed and more comfortable, and you've built up that little bit of rapport, that's when the shoot actually starts. Yeah. So you know the way I approach um, a shoot like that, typically when it's a longer portrait session, for example, is that I already know that the first eighty to hundred shots are just warm up shots. Mm-hmm. Like most likely, I'm not going to use any of that. Um, after about a hundred sh- uh, shots or something, you know, that's when that's when it really starts. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, the first half an hour, 40 minutes is pretty much just warming up and just getting to know each other and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, because as a photographer, you sometimes feel uncomfortable <laughs> to start with if you don't know that person. So, you know, it's also important for, for you as a photographer to relax into it. So how long did it take you out of interest between starting to do portraits to get into a stage where you feel, okay, I think, I think I'm kind of getting the hang of how to, you know, talk to models, move them in the way I need to move them, communicate with them, as you say. How long did that process take? Uh, it's really years. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you have to shoot a lot of people in order to get better at shooting people. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's like anything, yeah. you know. Yeah. Same with animals. It really is the same yeah. with animals. And, you know, especially if you're doing somebody's pet as well, um, you know, where, they are really set up there for for doing portraits and you've got lighting around and, and everything. Yeah. Again, the more you do, and I guess it's the same with any genre of photography, the more you do, the, the, the better you'll get with that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why my landscape photography is not up to par because <laughs> I never do it. <laughs> that's probably why. <laughs> Cool. That's fine, right? I mean, that allows you to be a portrait photographer and it allows a, a landscape photographer to do their craft and, and you're in different markets. So. Well, absolutely. But, you know, uh, and I always say this, it's it, that's, the, that's the awesome thing about photography is that there's always a genre that mm. you can learn from. Yeah. You know, you never stop. Um, you know, the day I get bored with, fo- with uh, portrait photography, you know, I'll be looking at something else and I don't have to look far. I mean, because there's so many different... Uh, things that you can get into wildlife photography um, landscape photography underwater photography I mean whatever you know yeah. it's there are so many different genres mm. um, you'll never stop learning with that it's a bit like music I compare it to music a lot you know yeah Very indeed. indeed yeah so so what are your plans for the future in terms of your photography um, I think for the future for me it's going to be more more wildlife photography and I think I need to step away from the zoos a little bit mm-hmm and try to investigate the British wildlife. Um, One thing that I haven't done, and I don't know whether it's just because there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of wildlife where where I currently live, um, but I need to just go out and search some of the British wildlife that we've got around, try and find some of the the red kites, try and find some of the eagles, try and find some of the kestrels, try and find some otters, um, you know, even some puffins and and some um, seals and just try and photograph these uh, animals in their natural habitat Mm. and try to step away a little bit from doing so much work in Photoshop. Not because I don't enjoy that um, and and not because I'm not very good at it uh, because I seem to get through that, Mm. but just because it would be nice to step away from my go-to on black um, image, um, which is, is... and maybe that is my trademark and maybe that's what I'm doing and maybe that is my style, but I kind of feel like I need to try and have some context around these animals rather mm. than just totally taking them out, yeah. um, which is what I have to do with the zoo animals because it's really important for me to make sure that whenever I photograph a zoo animal, you know, the animal is king here. We don't want to see any surroundings that they're in a zoo, they're in a compound, they're on some concrete somewhere, mm. 
you know, it just doesn't look good. Um, nobody wants to see that. A lot of people are very anti-zoo as well, um, although I think zoos do an awful lot for conservation. So whenever I present a zoo animal, it has to be just the animal, no surroundings whatsoever, no fences, no nothing. Mm. And I think if I photograph some British wildlife, I'm going to be able to use all of the natural surroundings that they're in. If they're in a stream, if they're in a tree or a field, I can actually use that and not have to worry about taking away all of the background. I certainly make the job a, a lot easier in creating the final image. Um, and then I just need to hunt out the art of that. Um, and for me, that's probably where I will struggle. Um, again, I think... Uh, one of the other areas that I really want to kind of develop is my uh, sort of dog portraits. Um, I've done five or six dog portraits at the moment before we uh, he uh, entered into to lockdown. Mm -hmm. I need to try and relaunch that and do some more. I've just been going around doing various friends' uh, pets at the moment uh, just for free uh, as a practice mm -hmm. uh, sort of session. And everybody absolutely loves these images that I'm producing. Again, another very sort of timeless uh, image in in the sort of grand masters very painterly looking images mm. um and again you know they're, they're the sort of images that you'll see for years and years and go that's my dog right. um some of, some of these images you know where you see people throwing food at the dog and the dog's going ah, yeah you know, they're great and they're off the moment but i think in a few years time you'll get tired of looking at that yeah. um it's not going to be the same as having, you know, what is essentially like a, a big oil painting on your wall of your dog. So, um, well, funny you should really... mention, funny you should mention dogs because I literally just got a puppy over the weekend. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll come along uh, when he's a little bit older and uh, come photographing for you. Did you? I did. <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> first I've heard of this. <laughs> but you'd be amazed to know that I haven't had the time to take the camera out in three days fair because. Enough, fair enough. Well, I haven't even slept for three days. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I might just be getting into dog photography myself. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, the, 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 there was a lot of competition out there. There's some really, really super uh, dog photographers out there yeah. that are producing amazing things. And some of the action shots that they're doing with, with these are just absolutely sublime. Um, but you know, I think it's it's such a big area that the, there's plenty of room for more photographers in that area, and it's one of those niche areas of photography where I think the owners at the moment they're very happy to spend whatever on their animals. Yeah. So I think if you're if you're a good solid photographer, and and, and I know you are, <laughs> you will have no issues in that area. Yeah. Um, I'm just w w warming up to that. Yeah, oh, it's it's an it's an interesting genre. Um, I've seen I know exactly uh, the kind of uh, photographs that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, they are fun. They're fun portraits. It's definitely a style. Yeah, um, yeah. But the thing about these kind of styles is they come and go, you know, they go in and out of fashion. Um, and you're right. I mean, they're, they're very off the moment now. They're, they're certainly interesting images. Um, mm -hmm. It's, yeah, I mean, the question is whether, you know, you can you can look at a photo like that for any length of time. It's very different from having sort of a timeless kind of portrait. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I know you're going to show us how you created that shot in lightroom yes. or photoshop uh in lightroom and photoshop right. um so the the original um chimpanzee image as i say started off as completely black image and um i couldn't believe my eyes at first i thought it was a totally black shot so if if i ever see a black shot that i've taken the first thing i'll do is just move the exposure slider up in in lightroom to see whether i've got anything there mm. just in case um, you know, I've been known to shoot with the uh, lens cap on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for those uh, for those people who are maybe new to the podcast um, and maybe at the beginning of their uh, photography career, in order to be able to do that really well, you want to be shooting in RAW um, yes. from the start. So although JPEG allows you to, um, you know, to alter the image and to edit, to edit the image uh, to a certain degree, you definitely have a lot more wiggle room in RAW. So uh, what that means is uh, when you look at your shot and it seems to be a little bit dark, there's most likely a lot more detail in the shadows that you can mm -hmm. bring out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of hidden um, from from view initially. But if you shoot in RAW, the camera actually uh, records a much wider wider spectrum. And uh, just, just as well in this case. Yeah. And in, in this case, that's absolutely vital, isn't it? Because you need absolutely. to kind of bring all that detail back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So why don't you show us how you made that particular shot? 
So um, as you can see, the starting image looks entirely black. There's just a very, very faint image of something here. The, the settings for this were 1 125th of a second at f4 and ISO 100. In reality, I should probably have been around about ISO 800 in this particular dark place and probably, um, yeah, f4 was as low as this lens could go anyway. So um, initially, I thought this image had nothing in it. Uh, so one of the things that I quite often do is just bump up the um, uh, exposure. And uh, what I did was I had the same image, sorry, I had the same problem across a number of images that they were a little bit underexposed. So I synchronized my settings across the images, which bumped up the exposure by two and a half stops. Um, that wasn't enough for this image. So I just cranked it up, cranked it up even more. Um, and now we're up to three stops. And then I started increasing the highlights. And I could see this faint image here of this chimpanzee, which looked you know, very much in focus, uh, but just dark. So I just kept on trying to push it, increasing the shadows as far as I could, increasing the whites as far as I could, changing the white balance on it as well, uh, which also helped tremendously, um, increasing the clarity, bringing up the vibrance, uh, and then again, bumping up the exposure again. So now the exposure is at 3.7 stops and already now we're seeing some clarity in that image there's a lot of noise going on here um, which i deal with um, so i then go through a whole point to try to crop it get the actual image that i want in in terms of cropping cropping out a lot of the the background so you know from from here where we've got this post and we've got this part of the compound area there um, and there's some of the background in there just just to crop that all out so I, I don't need to edit it out in in um in photoshop at all and then just really just try and do a little bit with the masking try and smooth it out a little bit to try and take away some of that noise which i which i've managed to do uh, pretty much there and again just reduce a bit of the noise and from that point i i took it over to photoshop and then then again just continued to edit it bring up the highlights increase some of the shadow areas. Um, but then the final image was this um, what, that I did. So again, if we look at this in full screen mode, you can see here that there's a lot more detail that's been brought out. Um, and, you know, there's a really, really nice image there. The eyes, the catch lights on the eyes were all natural. They weren't uh, embedded at all. Uh, you know, I didn't have to draw those on. Um, but I'm not afraid of drawing things onto um, onto animals or, or, or to images if I need to. Um, I've had to do that before. Now I've had to draw a, a part of a dog's tail on a, on a dog that where I cut the tail off um, or crop it from another image and put it in there. So, so yeah, so um, I think the overall edit took me around about three hours in, in total on this one. Um, it wasn't particularly complex, uh, but, you know, going from a completely and utterly black image um, to um, to this, you know, is, is, I still think it's quite amazing. Um, and then obviously to be selected as the winning image, um, absolutely blown away by that. I mean, if ever there were a photo which sings the praises of shooting in raw it's <laughs> this isn't it it's is absolutely. absolutely remarkable to go from what you started with yeah. to to that is just yeah. stunning yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, again i i had completely forgotten this was a pretty much a black image um it was only when i looked back at it last night in preparation for this meeting today and i was like okay so that was almost black right <laughs> Most times I would just have left that. It was just like there's not enough detail in 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 there to pull out, but surprisingly there was. Um, and, I, and obviously I've had to deal with a bit of noise uh, along the way as well, and, and sharpening's helped considerably. Um, and and you know if I zoom in here, there is still a little bit of noise around here. It's not it's not great. Um, it's not as nice as I would like, but it's sharp enough. You know at, at a distance it's sharp enough, um, and I think you know. All of this lighting is pretty natural. It's just been accentuated a little bit uh, with a bit of dodging and burning. Hmm. Um, and just, again, shaping the light around the body so it, it just falls off quite nicely. 
Um, perhaps, you know, as was mentioned last week, perhaps I should have darkened the knee a little bit. Um, I take that um, quite happily now, looking back at it in retrospect. But, you know, the, the, the detail around the brows, the way that the light falls off there, mm. darkening under the brows to try and make that brow feel more three-dimensional, as well mm -hmm. as lightening it here, was very, very key to this and, and just crisping up the detail around the eyes and just, you know, just emphasizing the the light where, where it would be touching and, and being faithful to where the light is coming from. You know, I didn't want to change the lighting too much on this, but just emphasize it. Uh, and just give it that feeling. And again, the style that I went for here was very, very uh, sort of painterly style where it's, it, it, you know, there, there is a certain loss of detail through that painterly style, but it also makes it look more sort of long lasting as, as an image. Um, and, um, you know, I think it works. I think it works pretty well. And I was pretty happy with that when, when I produced it. And again, I didn't want to go totally black and white on this because um, for me, it just wouldn't work as a totally black and white image. There's a little bit of color that bleeds through from the, the, from the animal's fur um, as I've brushed over it very gently with a mask to just allow some of that color to bleed through, but not all of it. And then obviously the eyes, and, and that for me is where, where everything looks. Again, I could have straightened the eyes out. I could have actually created that, that horizontal eye line there but i thought it being slightly off center there well, it was actually just perfect as well just leave it as it was and i didn't really want to tilt the image anymore to do that no that 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 makes it i think that would have felt unnatural to me and mm -hmm. you know any animal that's ever so slightly tilting its head immediately adds a totally different character to their to their face yeah. it does that inquisitive nature that you get in from it if, if they were looking deadpan at the camera you, you know they've been posed, you know they've been told to just sit there and, and, and especially with a chimpanzee, that you know, it's a, a trainable animal um, and you'd think, well, they've just been posed in that position. But the fact that it's it very, very slightly tilted, there's that sort of inquisition of him wondering what I'm looking at. Why are you looking at me? Why are you staring at me? What have I done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm just amazed. You know, they're beautiful creatures and uh, to have been treated so badly is just you know it's criminal and it's upsetting as well to to know about that but um you know i'm glad i've been able to capture something like this you know i feel like i want to recreate this photo with nick as a model wow <laughs> <laughs> thanks let's see if we can get the lighting just right <laughs> awesome now, this is really a it's, it's a fantastic shot thank you yeah it's a really stunning uh stunning portrait so yeah, well done for uh, for winning, and thank you so much for sending that in to yeah, us. Yeah, thoroughly deserved, and pleasure to look at. Thank you for selecting, and, and thank you for it being picked last week uh, mm. on the uh, podcast. I, I wasn't expecting that at all, actually, for that uh, for that selection at that time. Um, it was only by chance I was listening through, and, and then you mentioned at the end of that podcast that you were selecting the image. It's like, no! <laughs> I've not this place at, at once. Oh dear. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So Brian, one more time, thank you so much for sending in your, your shot. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, it was an education to see how you created that shot in the first place. Um, I'm still absolutely stunned how you could get that photo out of something that appeared totally black <laughs> in the beginning. Um, I must have some extra graphics processing in my computer, I think, to do that. But um, no, thank you very much. And uh, it's been uh, absolutely amazing to be selected. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. And for those, for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, uh, make sure you check out this episode on YouTube um, so you can see uh, the photo itself and you can see how, uh, how Brian edited the whole thing um, and also uh, don't miss out on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash camera shake podcast. You can see Brian's photo there. And uh, I'm sure we'll post uh, this video segment there as well. So again, thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Brian. You. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.